So welcome everybody to this, this free webinar on Epictetus, a great Stoic philosopher and his views on choice and, and character. Um, I think probably a lot of you know me already uh, from my videos, but let me introduce myself anyway. I'm, I'm Gregory Sadler. I'm the president of Reason.io, which is a company devoted, as it, as it says in the slogan down below, to putting philosophy into practice, and this is part of what we do. I'm also the editor of Stoicism Today, an online blog or magazine uh, which, which focuses on modern applications of Stoicism and understanding Stoic figures. Uh, it's part of the same organization that puts on Stoicon, the Stoicon Xs, and a number of other interesting things. And my, my uh, interest in Epictetus and Stoic philosophers goes back to graduate school. I would say that I didn't take them quite as seriously as I have started to over the last five years as a graduate student, you know, because I was you know, studying other things. But I, I've long had an interest in this particular topic of character and how our choices end up forming that. So this is a, one I've been really looking forward to. I think we're finishing the year strong with this. I also do want to put in a word about um, my, my Patreon supporters. This, uh, you know, this is essentially a free service, and it's being underwritten by those who support me on Patreon. It's through their generosity that I can afford to devote the time to producing uh, these sorts of, of uh, events and, and resources. So I just wanted to put in a little bit of gratitude about, about them. So what we're going to do um, in, in this is we're going to have a very brief introduction. Um, I'm going to raise a few interesting questions that hopefully you'll have some clear idea about by the end. And then the main topics that we're going to be discussing are, are Stoic philosophy and the three disciplines, one of which has to do with choice. And then this, this faculty of choice and how it is that we actually uh, modify it and use it in the process. Now, if, if that doesn't make a lot of sense to you at this time, that's perfectly fine. That's what the webinar is for. And then we have 20 minutes uh, reserved for question and answer, discussion, um, open conversation at the, the end of the webinar. So here's a couple questions to consider. And you don't have to consider these from a stoic perspective. These are much broader. Um, one is, do we really have a capacity to choose for ourselves? Are our choices free in any respect? I think not only in our own time, but if you look throughout history, we find some people asserting that our choices aren't in any meaningful way free. Um, what does that do to the whole notion of, say, character or choice or, or you know, deciding for ourselves? Another thing we want to think about is, well, what impact do the choices, whether they're free or not, that we make have on who we are and what kind of people we become? And then a third thing that intersects with that, what does it mean to have a good character? Is that something actually good for us, or is that maybe something that society just tells us we ought to have? And the Stoics have some very definite answers about these sorts of matters. So this, this webinar is the first, uh, we always do this early in the week, we have a, a free 45 minute webinar. Um, so it's going to introduce you to some of Epictetus' ideas uh, bearing on choice and character. Later on this week we have, uh, for those who are interested in this, intensive online seminars going much deeper into these ideas and adding some additional discussions about, you know, how we, we understand and change these things. So those are taking place on Saturday, December 16th uh, from 10 a.m. to 12 p.m., 4 p.m. to 6 p.m. Central Time. Um, so if you're interested in those, you might want to mark your calendar and uh, go back to the, your type form link and, and register. Otherwise, just uh, sit back and uh, enjoy what we've got and get ready to have some discussion. So the first topic I wanted to bring up, um, I didn't want to assume that anybody already had a, a deep background in Stoic philosophy, but I, but I was going to assume that at least people you know, had heard of Stoicism. Um, so here's some very basics about the Stoic school. It was a classical school of virtue ethics, which means that they hold that 
Um, virtue is the primary good for for human beings, and vice, or you know, the opposite of virtue, bad habits, is is the uh, the bad. And you notice I've got this this thing here about good, bad, and indifferent. So the Stoics differed from some of the other schools of virtue ethics, like that of the Aristotelians, in saying that really, when it came down to it, the only things that were genuinely good and bad in themselves are our states of character or our actions or things that, that come from us. Everything else like wealth or health or social esteem, all those are what they call indifferent. They don't have moral value, whether positive or negative, in themselves. Although they certainly can be used the right way or wrong way and that can conduce to something being good or bad, but they're not good or bad by themselves. The Stoics also had this ideal of living in accordance with nature, and that's kind of a complicated topic. Um, it's one I'm actually working on a short book on at, at the moment. Um, but you could say that in a nutshell what it means is we should sort of conform ourselves to the way that the universe is, and we should try to develop uh, what it is that our, our nature is as rational beings. Um, the Stoics also stressed, as, as you see other virtue ethicists doing, the interrelation between thoughts and feelings, and I think this is one reason why Stoic philosophy is so particularly useful in the present, because we have a lot of other uh, perspectives which tell us things like, well, you know, feelings can't be evaluated, you just have them, and you can't control your feelings. The Stoics thought, no, there actually is a linkage between thoughts and feelings. And so you can see this in, in certain uh, uh, psychological approaches like that of cognitive behavior therapy or the entire cognitive revolution, which of course gets its rise from Stoicism. Um, the Stoics also focus on making progress towards happiness or eudaimonia, not a, lat in a fleeting state of happiness, but a lasting state of happiness or doing well, and freedom. They, they laid a very high stress on that. So where does Epictetus fit in? Um, we typically divide the Stoa into an early, middle, and late period, and uh, unfortunately, we have very little of what the early and middle Stoa wrote. Um, a good portion of what we do have is coming down to us through texts that are not actually by Stoics, like, like Cicero, um, who gives us, you know, for example, Penetius' ideas on ethics in his On Duty. Um, and it's really, when it comes to the literature that we have at present, just the late Stoa that we, we possess. And, and we may not even have all of that. Um, Seneca and Musonius Rufus are coming earlier in time than Epictetus. Musonius was, of course, Epictetus's teacher in Rome. Um, and there was some historical connection. Epictetus's uh, owner, because Epictetus was a slave, um, he actually worked for Nero, who Seneca had worked for earlier, uh, before Nero commanded him to kill himself. And then we have Marcus Aurelius, you know, bringing up the rear, and he's a Roman emperor who has actually read Epictetus um, and, and brings him up uh, uh, in, in his meditations. There's, there's an uh, interesting distinction, and it appears to have had, um, you know, some sort of rooting in how Stoicism was being taught and, and thought about at the time of Epictetus uh, called the Three Disciplines. And you can find this discussed in his discourses. It's a doctrine that we find in Epictetus's works, but we don't find it elsewhere explicitly in Stoic literature. And as a side note, I think a lot of people tend to make a little bit too much of this because they follow Pierre Adot's great books, but, but a little bit speculative about these three disciplines you know, being correlated to all these other things, which, which we just don't see as, as the case. And so you see infographics with that. What we, what we can actually say Epictetus teaches us is that there's a discipline of desire, and that has to do with um, not just desires and aversions, but also the emotions, understanding them, reshaping them, a discipline of action, which has to do with choices and, and uh, refusals, and also with our duties, and then the discipline of assent, which has to do much more with the cognitive aspects of things. And he actually brings this up in the context of saying too many people want to jump, you know, leapfrog into the discipline of ascent and not focus on the other ones. So where does choice fit in here? Choice, um, there's really three different Greek terms or, or families of terms that, that get translated as choice, and, and they're all connected with each other. So there's this horme, which 
also means impulse in, in other thinkers. And it's the opposite to rejection. So choice and rejection, deciding on something and then doing it. This fits into the second discipline, the discipline of action. Um, there's also other language used in Epictetus's work of choice or choosing, you know, thelema in, in the noun and then thelene in the verb. This means something like to select or for it to be your will or your choice. And then a really key idea in Epictetus that is, is um, it's not unique to him, but, but his treatment of it is rather unique, is the faculty of choice, the proiresis, that in which... Uh, that in us, uh, that, that chooses. So that's a really important idea. So you see choice is already a little complicated. So let's talk about this faculty of choice, the proi races that I brought up. So the question that we can ask is, well, what is this? And if you look at translations, English translations, I actually should go and sometime look at what, what French, you know, common translations, they're probably volonté for the most part, or what German translations are, just for uh, some comparative stuff. But in English, we usually translate it as faculty of choice, so the part of us that, that actually engages in choosing, or moral purpose, and there's a good reason why we call it moral purpose. It's also got a sense of being something substantive, something lasting. And I'm not really happy with these sorts of translations, but sometimes people will use will or volition. I think there's good reasons to think that, you know, the faculty of will, as we later see it, isn't quite exactly the same thing as what Epictetus is calling pro um, And there's a lot of good scholarship out there on that. In Epictetus' Stoic psychology, it's really the same thing as two other things that he mentions. One of these is what he calls the ruling faculty, to hegemonikon, that is, you know, the thing that's in charge. We might call it the executive faculty. <clears throat> and then also there's what, what he calls the rational faculty, um, to logikon, um, the one that is, is thinking things out. And the reason why these, these can actually be the same thing is because for the Stoics, in a rather complicated way that I'm not going to try to explain here, choosing and um, cognition or thinking are not radically separated from each other. Um, so this is another reason why we don't probably want to call this the will, because later thinkers would distinguish between, say, the intellect and the will. Now, another key and really important aspect of this, for Epictetus, the proi racist is, is the core of the person. In some passages, he actually says, look, you're not your flesh, you're not your possessions, you are your proi racist. Or rather, not your proi racist, you are proi racist. That is what you are at your core, at, at the, the, you know, you might say the, the very fabric of, of your, your character or personality. So this is what the person is for better or for worse. And that makes it very important for us to look at. So let's talk about choice. Epictetus also makes a distinction that I think some of you may be familiar with. We actually did a uh, session on this uh, a couple months back between what is in our control and what's not in our control. And what isn't in our control are external things. These things are determined by something or someone other than ourselves. So, you know, if we take, for example, your reputation, um, you can certainly do things to screw up your reputation and you can try to build your reputation, but whether or not your reputation remains the same is very much dependent upon what other people choose to do or think or, or uh, say. And some of it's dependent on just, you know, the way physical processes work out. Now, Epictetus talks about what's falling in the scope of proi races, what is under it, what is, what is uh, you might say, uh, its business, is what is in our control. So what does this mean? He says that this includes our thoughts and our judgments. You know, opinions is another way to translate judgment. Uh, emotions, these are in our control. These are a matter of the proi races. Desires, choices, actions what we assent to, what it is that we, we think. Um, all of this is actually up to us in some degree. Now you might ask then, okay, so that's great. What then determines the proiresis? Because the proiresis controls all the other faculties of the human being in some way. I mentioned that it's like the ruling faculty, uh, which is essentially a synonym for it in Epictetus' uh, discourses and, and, and Um 
So all the other faculties that we have, all of the, the capacities of our body, uh, of our mind, um, everything else is subject to proiresis. Of course, you know, the body being something in the world, um, there's many things about it that you can't really control. You know, he uses example of illness and health. But here's where it gets really interesting. Proiresis also controls or determines proiresis. So there's what we call reflexivity. It bears upon itself. And it has freedom. This doesn't mean that it has total freedom where it can like you know, snap its fingers and become something radically different than, than what it is. Uh, we're going to talk about that in just, just a few minutes. But it does have a, a degree of freedom that we often don't take account of, we forget about, or sometimes we even uh, hide from ourselves. You know, especially when we're doing things that we know we shouldn't do. We blame it on things outside of our control. So Epictetus says that when something else seems to be determining the proiresis, or to use one of his favorite words, impeding it, to, to literally put fetters upon it, it's because proiresis has allowed that other thing to be decisive. Now, if this is starting to sound very familiar to you, but you haven't studied Stoic philosophy, but you have studied existentialist thought, you may, uh, in fact, see some parallels here. Or if you're you know, reading somebody like Descartes, Descartes says some similar things as well. Descartes is influenced by the Stoics. Um, there's, there's a number of other uh, thinkers and movements that, that take a similar stance towards what they call the will. Um, Proiresis, in this case, is, is what, what Epictetus is, is focusing on. And he, he tells us that, that the only thing that can really rule or govern or, or determine proiresis is proiresis. And when it becomes corrupted, it's proiresis' own fault. Now, you know, this is us, right? so you don't want to say, well, my proiresis made me do it, because you are your proiresis. So there's a few things, though, that, that human choice can't actually do. There are some limitations on it. It can't successfully choose the nature of things to be other than they are. So, for example, if you tell yourself stories about how you can make you know, bad choices day in, day out, and it's not going to really make you into a bad person, um, no, you will become a bad person, and you're choosing to, to tell yourself essentially a lie about the way things work. You, you, just by choosing uh, that, you're not going to make things different. Epictetus even says, you know, the gods themselves, when they made human beings, they, unfortunately, they had to, you know, give us parts that, did, that didn't, you know, they were not as amenable like the body to uh, our, you know, our, our higher um, faculties. And they would have done it differently if they could have. So there's, there's something about the nature of things that just is the way it is, and we, can't, we can choose to go along with it, or we can choose to fight against it. We also can't make things that are outside of our control actually be in our control. And this is a, a, a lifelong struggle for some of us. Um, even those who are, you know, very steeped in and practicing Stoicism uh, find themselves falling uh, into temptations to try to make things that are outside of our control actually be in our control. And this is really uh, along the same lines. You, you, things that are outside of your control, according to the Stoics, just are that way, and you're not going to change the nature of reality. The other thing that's really important for what we're talking about here is that we can't immediately change the structure of our established character. And if you think about your character in terms of proiresis, it's not just what you've chosen, it's how your proiresis has chosen to shape itself, to direct itself, to orient itself. And once that happens, it's not as if you can, as I said, snap your finger and, and you know, say, okay, I'm changing all of this right now. Um, so let's talk about character now. Um, what, are we, what do we mean when we're discussing character? For the Stoics, um, they had some pretty clearly defined ideas about good character, and Epictetus fills this out quite a bit. He frames it primarily in terms of having one's proiresis in accordance with nature, a fully developed human nature. So what it is that our, our human potential as rational creatures would um, put forward. And, and he doesn't think that many of us do, in fact, realize this 100%, but that doesn't mean that we can't um, make progress towards it. So 
Another way of making this a bit more concrete it, that the Stoics talked about a lot was developing and acting in accordance with the virtues. Um, and we'll talk about those in just a minute. Another thing that Epictetus really stresses, but you also see this in, you know, for example, Cicero and Seneca, fulfilling duties involved in one's roles and relationships. And then finally, um, dealing with, using, is another way of translating the Greek there, of krisis, uh, appearances or the things that, that impinge upon us, the things that come to, come, uh, to us. Uh, they're also translated as impressions or you might even say imaginations, fantasiae. External things uh, and emotions. Dealing with these things well is part of what gives us good character from the Stoic perspective. So let's talk about the virtues. Um, the Stoics did not come up with the cardinal virtues. Plato actually, uh, you know, is the one who formulates these in, you know, for example, the Republic. Um, in, in a few other works, he, he actually includes piety, but, it, but it's not quite clear if that's just supposed to be part of justice or not. But these four virtues are, are viewed as, as um, things that are rooted in the soul. They become part of who we are, and each of them has opposed vices as well. And each of them helps us fulfill what it is to be a human being. Uh, each, of this, each of them makes us function well. Wisdom teaches us what we ought to do, helps us to uh, pursue truth for its own sake. Justice, which doesn't include only um, you know, following laws and fulfilling promises, but also includes benevolence for the Stoics, um, you know, taking care of people, that is uh, very important. And, and this responds to this social instinct that we have as rational creatures. Courage, um, which could include battlefield courage, but also includes standing up to tyrants and bullies and being able to stay firm in our convictions, being able to be, uh, as, as you know, we, it's not a word we use much any, these days, but magnanimous, um, you know, a great soul, that's part of courage. And then self-control, you know, being able to give reason the the, the last uh, dis, you know decisive voice in what it is that we ought to do instead of just following our appetites or desires for bodily pleasures or to avoid bodily pains. These are all important aspects of the Stoic life. And, and if you want to know more about these, I would read Cicero's On Duties. He discusses these in, in great detail. Now, there's another one that Epictetus talks about a lot. He brings it up. He doesn't actually talk about virtue or the virtues uh, quite as much as the others because he uses prairesis instead. Um, but, you know, a virtue is a particular way in which one's prairesis is shaped. The one that he probably talks about the most is fidelity or pistis, a um, word that we also translate as faith, um, you know, in, in uh, other contexts. And... This has to do with something that is very closely connected, I think, with justice, but perhaps may be uh, understood as a little bit different than, than just justice on its own. But this is, is what he means by having good character. He also really stresses um, duties. Duty is translating um, the, the Latin officium, the Greek katheikon. This is a, a thing that the Stoics talked about quite a bit. And this falls under the discipline of action, what we ought to do, right? Uh, the Stoics thought that many of our roles and relationships, uh, even though they're not chosen by us, they give us our duties, and then we have choices whether we're going to, say, fulfill our duty or not, or whether we're going to uh, fulfill it, but we're going to roll our eyes and, and you know, kind of cut corners or, or things like that, right? So we not only choose whether or not we fulfill the duties, but we also choose our outlook and our motivations. So if you've got a parent, for example, Epictetus has plenty of examples of, of uh, parents who do not measure up quite to, to what they ought to be doing. You have a choice. Are you going to be a good child to them? Or are you going to say, well, I'm not getting what I want from mom and dad, so screw them. I'll do whatever I want. That's your choice. You, you actually have a choice about that, and that forms your character. So let's talk finally now about um, the role of habit. Habit is, is the bridge, you could say, between choice and character. And this is something that not only holds for Epictetus, not only holds for the Stoics, but holds for virtue ethics in general, this, this, this centrality of habit. So let's talk about character as kind of a starting point. 
And, and I want to point something out to you that I certainly know from experience myself, and I think you could probably agree to as well. By the time that we start thinking about our character, we've usually developed a character with its whole range of habits. They could be good or they could be bad. In my case, you know, uh, by the time I started thinking about this sort of thing, I was doing it in part because I wanted to work on problems with my character, and I think this may be something many can relate to. So we already have desires and aversions, and they've already been shaped into, into particular you know, directions, you could say. We already have typical emotional responses. We already have uh, patterns of choices that we've made. And uh, we can also think about beliefs or judgments that we hold about important matters as being part of these habits. It's not merely about what we do. It's also about what we think. And one important aspect of this that I think is not stressed enough, but, but there's certainly plenty of room for in Epictetus, is the role that the relationships we maintain. Um, he talks about, you know, sometimes you actually have to change who your friends are if you want to improve morally, but also the stories that we tell the ways in which we, we uh, look at situations. This, is, this relates to, if you've, if you've ever heard him say, uh, we can always pick things up by one of two handles. One of the handles we can carry it, the other handle we can't. That is about the stories that we tell about what it is that we're doing. Some stories are going to make us bitter and resentful and um, are going to make it impossible for us to carry the things that we need to carry. Other narratives are going to do the opposite. So here's a good question. You know, the Stoics really liked this guy Heraclitus, who we don't know that much uh, about, and we don't really have many writings from. We have fragments, and here's one of the most famous fragments, Athos Anthropo Daimon, and it's often translated as character is destiny. There's other ways of translating it, but, but that, that, that's good for the present, right? Character is destiny. So what does this mean? Does this mean that, you know, we get our character and we're just kind of stuck with it? So that, you know, however it happened, the way we were born, the way we were raised, the people that we fell in with, the institutions that we participated in, we're just kind of stuck with that? Or does this mean that these are both in our control and affected by our choices, that we can change our character and thereby we can change our destiny, we can change our fate, we can change... Um, you know, if we want to play on the words, we can change whether we have an eudaimon or a deusdaimon, a good or bad uh, spirit or not. So this is where habits become very important. Epictetus tells us that once we have an, an established habit, it's going to guide our choices and actions and emotions and thoughts, often in a very automatic way. Uh, if we're not paying close attention to it, if we're not applying uh, you know, what, what the Stoics called prosoche, which sometimes gets translated as mindfulness or attentiveness, then we're liable just to follow along with the, the same way that we've always been doing things. So Stoic philosophy can help us to understand where we've been going wrong or right in these. As a matter of fact, Epictetus likens his uh, school to going to the doctor's office, and he says, you know, you're probably not going to like it here. Um, nobody goes in, I mean, it's not like the present, right, where our doctor's visits are sometimes not, not so bad. Nobody goes into the doctor's office expecting it not to hurt, he says. <laughs> so, so don't expect that to be the case going into the stoic school. And he says it's not reasonable to expect that we're going to be able to simply choose a different character once we have a, a better perspective. And you see a lot of people doing this, with, not just with Stoicism, but with personal development and, and applications of philosophy in general. They, they read uh, some Stoic philosophy and they're like, oh, that's, you know, now I understand how I ought to behave. I'll just do that. And Epictetus would say it's not quite so easy as that. Um, if it were, then you wouldn't actually need a discipline of action. So, you know, we can think about it this way. Choices affect our, our habits. We have to make choices repeatedly, often against the established grain, in order to change who we are, in order to change the habits. So this is where we're using our prioracis to change our prioracis, right? We have to impose discipline upon ourselves. And as he says, go, go over to the other extreme. He's got an example of a ship that, you know, kind of tilts to one side. Well, you've got to push it all the way to the other side to get it to come back. And we often do have to change our setting and companions. 
Um, you know, he he says at at one point, boy, if you're going to try to be a stoic, but you're going to hang around with all these these other people who definitely are not into that, it's not really going to take. You don't have the the capacity to do that. It, it's you know a common human problem. Um, the other thing that he stresses that's kind of a, a, a cause for hope is, and this is in the Anchoridian, uh, also in the discourses, the resources for responding more appropriately to situations, they are within us. We have those resources, but they have to be cultivated. So when we encounter situations where we might be tempted, say, to you know, make a fool of ourselves in terms of uh, you know, our, our, our sexuality and, and behavior, well, we have temperance for that. But we have to decide to deploy it. We have to decide to take the, the bit of it that we find inside of ourselves and cling to it, almost like a, a shipwreck you know, clinging to a, a board. Right? And if we don't do that, if we don't make that choice, well, no surprise if, if instead we do something stupid. And so in every situation, Epictetus says, we can remind ourselves about that what we choose has a lasting implication. Beyond that situation, it's not just choosing for right now. We're choosing what we're going to be like next week. If I am struggling, as I often have in my life, with anger, and I decide to apply the stoic remedy to it, it's not going to be easy. But I'm making it easier for myself the next time and the next time and the next time. If I only think about this, this given situation right now, I can lose sight of the fact that if I keep doing the same thing, I'm actually making that habit stronger and making myself worse off. So now we have reached the time for dedicated question and answer. Uh, feel free to unmute yourself and, and ask whatever you'd like, or if you want to use the chat function, I'll, I'll read your question out loud and uh, answer it. Um, so who wants to go first? Ah, so Marco's got a good question here. To what extent can we choose our environment and circumstances according to Epictetus? So um, that's going to depend on, on you know, who we are. I, I would say that if Epictetus were around in our present, he would say that there's, there's a good bit that's not in our control. Um, you know, how the economy functions, totally out of our control. Um, the family that we, we got, you know, dealt, uh, got born into, that's not something in our control. What we do with those things is in our control. Um, although the outcomes are not, you know, you can try to be a, a great person to your, your family and they can treat you like a jerk, you know, or uh, uh, treat you as if you're the adolescent that they remember from 20 years ago or whatever. Um, and likewise, you can make good good investments, but but lose out in the economy. Um, we can choose quite a bit more, I would say, today than than people in the past. You know, especially since we have, for example, the internet. Um, we're, you know, like what we're doing right now is a matter of our choices. Everybody who showed up here chose to show up, uh, presumably because they had some interest in character and apertitis and you know improving their life, <laughs> that sort of thing. Um, but we, we do have to recognize, um, you know, some limitations. And the other thing I would say about that, too, is these are not choices that we make once and for all. Um, oftentimes, you know, we get ourselves a little breathing room by, say, breaking off a toxic relationship, um, and things get better for a bit, and then we realize, oh, um, this isn't the only thing that I need to work on in my life. I have to, you know, change this over here. Um, so, yeah. Mark has a good question here. Is Epictetus advising us not to make value judgments? No, not at all. Um, I mean, we, we have to make value judgments. Um, as a matter of fact, we can't avoid making any value judgments whatsoever because if we did, we, would, we wouldn't desire or uh, be averse to anything. Um, and we do have to engage in, in some actions. It's a question of making value judgments correctly. And Epictetus and the Stoics would say that most people tend to get these things wrong. Um, and if you know, this is not something I was talking about in here, but this is something we could we could certainly get into. Epictetus um, talks about the role of of it gets translated as contradiction, but I, I would say um, tension or um, what would be a better way of translating? The Greek term is mache, which means battle, conflict, right? When we talk about a person having internal conflicts, 
um, it's because their value judgments and the, the emotions and, and other things that stem from those are not all harmonious with each other. And this is the way that we, we start out. Um, you know, by the time that we start to study Stoic philosophy, we're usually kind of a mess. And we, we make ourselves less and less of a mess. We're, we're using, you could say, we're using the prioracist to prune away at parts of the prioracist that are screwed up. We're using the rational faculty to bear upon itself and to make it more rational. Um, those are really the same, two, two sides of the same coin. So it is very important to, to make value judgments, but to make them correctly. And Stoic philosophy, I think, is a useful guide for that. Um, although I, I wouldn't say that you know it's supposed to be followed slavishly. Uh, you know, you, you do see some people in the Stoic forums um, being almost like uh, fundamentalists. You know. Uh, quoting chapter and verse and thinking that proof text thing like that solves everything. No, we're supposed to think this through, you know. We're supposed to, you might say, internalize it and make it, uh, make it our own. Um, and, you know, and adapt to the circumstances that we find ourselves in, which, which are very different than, than the culture that Epictetus uh, lived in and was shaped by. So we might, you know, discard some of it. I mean, I have a beard, so Epictetus would say I, I'm on the right track, but do all men need to have beards uh, in order to, to look like men? I don't think so. <laughs> you know? Some of that is culturally conditioned. We'd get rid of that sort of stuff. But the core of it, I think, is, is quite sound. Mm. Here's a good question from Marco. Any thought about choice and character in connection with a leadership role in business? Um, yeah, I think, you know, not just in business, but leadership roles. This is something I was talking about with one of my clients um, who is in a leadership role, so it comes up an awful lot. And it's so easy to become corrupted in leadership roles because you can have people, you know, kind of um, justifying what it is that you do, right? And so you, you really have to be careful not to... Um, you know, make the wrong choices, which then become habits and, and start justifying themselves. Um, I, I think that, you know, when an organization functions well, and not just well for, say, its stockholders, but for, um, you know, what we call its stakeholders, which would include its employees and, you know, the outside community, it's going to often be because of good leadership. And good leadership is not just, you know, getting people to do things. It's getting them to do the right things in the right way, you know, building the kinds of relationships, building a, a, a culture, for example, of trust and accountability um, that runs all the way from the bottom to the top so that the people at the top are, are holding themselves accountable and being treated as, as accountable. Um, that's kind of rare, I think, these days, particularly not just in corporations, but in academic institutions as well. Um, that's, that's a real problem. So uh, let me scroll up a bit because it looks like we've got a lot of questions. Um, Apirian writes, I know the weakness of my character and the direction I need to go to improve, but I keep falling back into being a slave to my desires. How can I keep the discipline for a longer period? Um, well, if, if it really is the case where you're not making any progress in, like, extending the amount of time, because you are, you are going to fall. Epictetus, you know, says it's, it's like wrestling. You know, you're going to get knocked into the dust, and uh, you've got to get yourself up. Um, but if you're really not finding that there's any, um, you know, longer time between the fall, then I would say probably that, that's a, a sign that you need to look at your thinking process and what's going into, you know, the, the lead up to the fall, you know, because it's never just like, well, I was, you know, doing great and then boom, you know, suddenly I was uh, uh, at the strip club you know, or something like that. There's always some sort of story there that you can analyze. And I think, you know, stoic philosophy can provide some good resources for that, but I don't, I don't know that you'd find all of the stuff that you would need in Stoic philosophy. It often, same thing with, with Aristotelian uh, virtue ethics. It often works very well in conjunction with um, psychotherapy and um, other, other resources for, that we use to modify our, our characters. Uh, Emmanuel, can somebody be a marketer and a Stoic at the same time? Um, it depends on what kind of marketer they're being, you know. 
if they're being uh, a marketer that uh, says anything goes, clearly not, you know. If they're trying to do it in, in an ethical way, which will probably involve turning away some clients and uh, not being quite as world, you know, successful in a worldly way, um, then I don't see any, any inherent incompatibility um, for it. So, you know, and we could say similar things about other, other tasks as well. Um, you know, so long as, as you, I mean, you'd, you'd want to think in terms of like the virtues uh, as a useful guide, particularly justice. Are you, are you going against any of the things that, um, say, Cicero tells us or, or Epictetus tells us about how we ought to behave or Seneca? Um, those would be useful guide, guideposts. Um, it is an interesting question. This is a bit of a digression, but I'll, I'll say this. There's a lot of people who want to see, I think, want their stoicism to fit some something else, you know, that they're really more interested in and because they, they, they're attracted to stoicism. And then they're like, yeah, I'd also like to get to do this 100%. And often, I mean, this is contained within Epictetus. We, we have to decide which things we value more because sooner or later they're going to probably run into conflict with each other. And then, then we've got to make a decision. That, and that is part of how we determine our, our pro races, the, these things that we choose to sacrifice to each other. Um, we, we don't usually get to have it all at the same time. Um, John has a question here, a comparative question. My thoughts on Buddhist non-attachment in relation to Stoic indifference, preferred versus non-preferred indifference. Um, I don't really have too many. There's, there's a good bit of discussion out there doing comparative work about Buddhism and Stoicism. And, you know, in part because I used to teach uh, you know, comparative religion and, and did a good bit of research. Whenever somebody says Buddhism, I'm always like, you know, my immediate instinct is think, okay, which Buddhism do you mean? Because um, there's a lot of schools out there and they're not all on the same page about everything. I mean, there is sort of a, you could say, a common core of texts, but then they're interpreted different ways. Um, I mean, I, I think there, there was actually a great um, piece by... Uh, one of, one of the members of, of the Modern Stoicism Project, Greg Lopez, uh, last year, I think it was, we published it, and it was, it was discussing, it wasn't discussing non-attachment, it was discussing um, is, you know, Stoic uh, prosoche the same thing as Buddhist mindfulness? And his answer was no, it's not. It, it's, it's something that's similar in certain respects, but not the same thing. And I think, you know, taking a stab at this, I would say it's kind of a, a similar... Uh, thing to that, right? We we can say that there there are some ways in which it's it's similar, but we want to look at not just that single concept, but what role it plays within the larger system. Because stoicism is a system, a net, as one of my friends and colleagues, uh, Travis Hume, uh, very you know uh, you know nicely framed it. He ta ta talks about it as a sort of a, a network of, of concepts connected with each other. And I think he's totally right about that. Um, and this is why it's, it's hard for me to answer the question about Buddhism because you have different you might say Buddhist networks depending on which school we're talking about. Um, so there's my it's not a really good answer, but it's it's uh, I'll count it as an answer nonetheless. <laughs> All right, what other questions have, have you guys got? Uh, we're getting close to the end. Uh, if you don't have any, I'll, I'll jump ahead into the, the final stuff. But if you do have any other questions, I'll, I'll hang around for a little bit over time because I, I, my, my talking went a bit over time, my lecture part. So I want to make sure everyone has the opportunity to ask whatever questions they want to. While people are thinking about any, any final ones, let me tell you about some useful Epictetus resources. So um, <clears throat> I think probably a lot of you know about my, my videos. There is a Stoicism playlist, which is kind of cool. Um, and I'll have more uh, videos coming up in, in the, the, the months, you know, in, in 2018. But I think I've probably got close to like 60 videos on Epictetus alone. We also have this free Epictetus Enchiridion course in the Reason.io Academy. 
Um, it's just specifically on the NCridian, but it's got a lot of uh, video content and handouts and cool stuff like that. Um, so all, all you have to do with that is type in Reason IO Academy and, and you'll, you'll find it. And then we've got the uh, Deeper Dive online seminars on this topic uh, uh, coming up on Saturday, December 16th. Remember, these are central times, so if you're in a different time zone, you want to make sure to, to, to get those, those times right. Uh, so wrapping up the uh, Q&A, uh, I'll take this, this last set of questions from Emmanuel then. Why in certain parts of the Enchiridion does Epictetus advise not to preach Stoicism to others? Uh, I mean, sharing the concepts a little bit with others that have problems might be useful for them sometimes. Yeah, and I think sharing, sharing uh, concepts with others is not the same thing as preaching Stoicism. Um, Epictetus is concerned about, you know, this runs not just in the Enchiridion, but really through the, the discourses. Um, the, uh, there were a lot of people back then, a, as today, who would like adopt Stoicism as sort of the way people jump into self-help programs. Now I'm a Stoic, you know? Uh, and and they, they hadn't internalized it. And that's, that's not going to be very productive. Um, it never is for any approach. You have to spend some time with it internalizing it, practicing it, before you, you should really start talking about being in that, that, that group, you know. Um, and it can actually become quite an impediment, you know, when people spend more time, as he says, like, you know, arguing about what Chrysippus is, is saying and less about applying it. Um, but, but Epictetus doesn't think that that precludes you from actually you know, sharing Stoicism with people when they're receptive to it. But he, he's saying, listen, if you're not actually walking the walk, um, it's not going to hurt Stoicism because Stoicism is, is just a set of concepts. But people are going to laugh at you because you're not going to be able to pull it off. And, and that's not going to be good for you. That's not going to be helpful in your progress. John has a question, the best way to follow me, um, Twitter. I do have a Twitter account. Uh, it's Philosopher70. Um, I mean, if you just type in Gregory Sadler, um, all sorts of things will pop up. My Facebook page, you know, uh, our, I think our Reason.io Academy, my YouTube channel, there's, there's, there's a lot of things. The, the social media that I use the most are um, Facebook, Twitter, uh, Google+, and LinkedIn. Um, occasionally I'm on Reddit, but I don't really... I don't really like the format, so I don't do too much with that. Um, and then, of course, you know, YouTube has a, a social function again. So, all right. Um, let me one more time uh, thank my, my Patreon supporters for, you know, generously contributing to my earning an income doing this sort of thing, which is what allows me to be able to provide these, uh, these free webinars. Um, and... Um, let me go back to the, the, the wrap-up. Um, any other uh, quick questions to get in under the wire before we uh, conclude this, this webinar? All right, well, I will say uh, have a great day. Um, those of you who are on the other side of the Atlantic, have a great evening. Um, and uh, those of you who are here in this hemisphere, uh, have a, a great morning or afternoon, whatever, whatever it happens to be, depending on what time zone you're in. And we'll have more of these coming up. We'll have the online uh, seminars coming up this Saturday. Great questions, and I very much enjoyed this.